Hello, thank you to those of you who've just been waiting. This is Paul Sims once again, Chairman at IFA Pharma. I'm speaking to you today from our office in London. Uh, and welcome, welcome to today's webinar. As you can see in front of you, it's called uh, The Rep of Tomorrow Today. Uh, and it's actually proven to be a very popular uh, webinar. I think we've just about hit 1,700 people as uh, sign-ups. Um, so that's obviously great news. This has obviously fired your imagination. Uh, and indeed, I suppose it's a title that deliberately talks about how we actually look at the futuristic situation, the destination that we're trying to reach, and get there more quickly, get there today, uh, as it says. Um, so I'm uh, hoping for a pretty interactive discussion today. We've got some great panelists, as you can see on the screen, but they by no means have every answer. So I'm really hoping that uh, you guys can, can be part of this conversation. You'll see the questions uh, box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and in fact, it would be appreciated if you just write a little hello in there now so I can check everything's working. You can all hear me, uh, and it will make me feel popular, which is obviously very nice. So uh, do that. Okay, yep, getting, getting lots of hellos in now. Okay, so guys, now you know how to use the questions box. Please do continue to use it uh, throughout, and uh, we'll actually have a really good discussion as a result. Um, today's session is also being recorded, uh, and we'll send you that recording in a couple of days' time after this uh, session. So don't worry, uh, you don't need to ask me, uh, and uh, obviously you can share this with your team or whoever else you wish to uh, after, the, after the webinar. So um, let's just uh, quickly take a, a moment at uh, what we're going to be doing. Um, the motivation for this webinar, I suppose, is that there's a really strong sense that the existing skills that our sales reps have, that our MSLs have, um, is not necessarily how they're going to define their future success. We're going to really have to change our minimum expectation, and so much of the future of our industry will depend on factors like our ability to personalize, our ability to uh, change the uh, perception of our value with our customers. And of course, these frontline people uh, are going to need to be the trust creators, the data sources, the educators, uh, the fonts of the patient insight that we've been able to generate, as well as obviously being entrepreneurial in terms of their own management and keeping a keen eye on customer experience as well. So it's a tough ask, I have to say. It's a tough ask. We're expecting a lot from, from these people. We're going to have to arm them with a lot of tools, uh, and um, we're going to have to uh, ensure that uh, they're the right kind of people as well. So there's a lot of work to do going forward, um, despite the reduced numbers, I suppose, over all of these, of these people. Um, uh, and uh, that's the point of today's session. We're going to try and sort of establish get some kind of consensus, obviously it's not going to be the same for everybody, consensus as, as to where we're actually trying to get to, and then uh, hear some ideas and techniques about how we're going to get there. So I'm just going to give you a very quick intro to uh, our uh, panelists. You'll see Ludovic at the top left. He's the head worldwide of field medical and medical effectiveness at BMS. Uh, he's a, an international executive. He's uh, also spent seven years in consulting with Accenture, um, but a further 10 in the industry across commercial and medical affairs organizations across several therapeutic areas. He's led operational excellence transformation and field force effectiveness projects in various different guises. Uh, and he's also, um, even outside of uh, pharma, he's an executive coach, so he's uh, clearly uh, very good at the people management side of things. And he describes himself as a keen skier after he was brought up in the uh, French Alps. So uh, uh, lots of, uh, well, maybe not this time of year, but uh, lots of skiing to come, no doubt. Uh, if we go to the right side of your screen, you'll see Chris. Chris uh, and I had a wonderful conversation in Philadelphia about this very topic not so long ago. Um, he is an award-winning uh, commercial leader, extensive success delivering results and exceeding revenue, and was most recently with Zenovia uh, in, in the US as a vice president of sales. He's uh, demonstrated a lot of leadership capability, uh, and he's also demonstrated his ability to front not just in the commercial sense, but in uh, the artistic sense. He's a lead singer in two rock bands, no less, in two Jersey, uh, in New Jersey, which he, cover, uh, which he describes as the cover band capital of the world. Uh, Rolling Stones, Beatles, I believe, are, uh, are the uh, general directions that he likes to go in. And indeed, he's got a gig on Saturday night. So uh, if you're in the area and wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't mind uh, popping along to see Chris in a slightly different uh, situation, then uh, I'm sure he'd uh, entertain you uh, on Saturday. Um, Michael, uh, going back to the left-hand side of your screen, he's the Enterprise Account Director for Pharma at QStream. 
And actually, just while I'm mentioning Michael's name, I want to say Qstream have been a fantastic support in actually helping to create today's uh, webinar and put it together. Um, they've very much um, been on the design front and on the uh, making sure we've got everyone signed up front. So really appreciate uh, them and they've been great to work with. Michael himself is an experienced uh, software as a service sales executive um, when working with, with life sciences companies for, for, for about 10 years now. Uh, and uh, has, has helped a lot of customers solve uh, problems with technology solutions. Uh, so um, great that uh, Michael's here. He's also got, by the way, experience in clinical trials and R&D. Um, and uh, his hobby, believe it or not, is endurance sports. He's a former marathon runner uh, and is now a long distance cyclist. So uh, if you're feeling inadequate today, that's probably because of him. He's, uh, he's going a bit further than you are. So uh, very impressive uh, stuff there, Michael. Um, David is uh, Director of Sales and Marketing at CSL Bearing. Um, really appreciate you joining us, David. He's got 10 years, uh, t more than 10 years of strong commercial and brand management experience at affiliate level and above country. Uh, a lot of leadership, uh, again, on display, uh, a lot of implementation. Um, and he describes himself as not a sportsman, but he has recently transitioned after spending time watching tennis has, has, has uh, made it part of his life as of late and uh, is now uh, training with professional players, although he describes himself as not a professional just yet. So uh, don't, uh, don't raise your expectations too high. I think uh, he was keen to point out there. Um, and then last but certainly not least is Patrick. He's the Managing Director and Head of Commercial Operations uh, for Oncology in Daichi Sankyo. Um, he's a dynamic and results-oriented leader with multi-country uh, experience, um, both in pharma and devices, actually. Uh, he's also got a lot of experience in uh, business startups um, and uh, geographic and portfolio expansion generally. So he's uh, got a good growth mentality. Uh, he's also worked in biosimilars and injectables market development. So really uh, interesting range of, uh, range of things. He shares uh, the uh, passion for skiing. He also shares a passion for being in a rock band, although he no longer is. Uh, nowadays, uh, although he says it uh, requires just as much energy, he's a professional chess player for the last five years and uh, says that he needs to get back to practicing, but I'm pretty sure he could beat uh, any of us when it comes to chess. So uh, hopefully uh, you agree with me. That's a very interesting lineup that we've got for you today, um, and uh, we're going to have a good discussion. The first thing I'm actually going to do is hand over to Michael, who's going to just um, preface, preface the uh, discussion today with a couple of slides. Uh, so Michael, um, over to you. I'd love to hear what it is that you are going to introduce us to. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Paul. So um, can you maybe uh, go to my first slide, please? I certainly can, sorry, just... Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, everybody who's on the call today. We've got a great panel and uh, we're looking forward to giving you some insights into uh, the rip of today, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow today. Uh, we take you through the journey of how we can help <laughs> your sales reps today how we can help them maybe 10 years down the road. Uh, so just, I, I will give you a little bit of background on QStream and uh, I will just relate it to the, um, the topic today, the sales rep of the future and how the role we actually play in that. So um, the QStream solution that is used today by over 100 pharma companies, we've been working with pharma companies now for over 10 years. The solution or the platform was founded on the basis of 20 clinical studies that were carried out by the Harvard Medical School. And the outcome of those clinical studies uh, brought out two things. One is that it is possible to reinforce knowledge, key information that uh, professionals need to have in their field so that they are credible in front of their customers. That was the number one thing that came out of this predict these particular studies. But more importantly, and, that's, and what is very relevant to today's discussion is it also showed that you can actually change on-the-job behavior over time. And why that's important for today's discussion is uh, the last few years, for about the last five years, our customers have been telling us that they need to move their sales reps in a different direction. They want to move them away from the transactional model, you know, the old model of uh, buy three of these drugs and you can get the extra one free, to a more value-add model, providing value to the customer with the patient in mind. So, so what does that mean? Well, the conversation that uh, um, the new sales rep would have would go along the lines of uh, this particular drug lowers glucose 
by this amount. So the sales rep is actually providing information about how the drug actually works and also reduces uh, following side effects by this amount. And then compared to other drugs in the market, this is where it is different. So it is providing a lot of value to the HCP or the customer that the customer can then share with the um, uh, with the patient. So so that is something that we have been doing for our customers uh, using QStream to help change this behavior. And why that's so important to our customers is that they want to maintain their current investment in their sales force. Um, because the new sales rep, the sales rep of the future, he's going to have to be, she is going to have to be a critical thinker. Uh, they're going to have to provide key insights to their customers. And as I'm sure all of you on the phone today realize, not all of your sales reps can do that. So what do you do? Do you completely uh, change over your sales force and bring in new salespeople that have that mindset? Well, if you do that, that's going to be very expensive. So what we've done with our customers is we've helped them change the behavior of their sales reps. The reality is, is about 20% of the sales reps, they get this and they're able to do it. Bottom 20% just don't. But then it's this middle 60%. That's what it's all about for us. We move that 60% away from the transactional model and we move them over to this value add model. And therefore, our customers are protecting their investment in their sales force and they don't have to go through expensive uh, transitions with their sales teams. Uh, can I see the next slide, Paul, please? So here are the five things, working with our customers, uh, here, here are the five attributes that they deem are critical for the sales rep of the future. These are the things that the sales rep should be able to do. So it's really, as you can see, it's all about uh, providing insights. That's the key thing. You have to provide insights. And sometimes this may require that your sales rep, rep is almost a provocateur in that they will have to get their customers thinking along different lines as well. But the key really is that they're providing them with insights. So their role is they become more consultative. Almost at times they are like a teacher. And ultimately for all of this to happen, it has to be culturally driven. We find with our customers, our key customers, they have a cultural model that's moving and this is mandated from the top down and it is supported from the top down. So that's the role that we play in helping uh, our customers move to this new model. And that's, that's what I've got to say right now. Okay, thank you, Michael. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you'd uh, finished there or not. Okay, so that's uh, that's definitely given us um, some some food for thought already. Just just quickly before you go, um, I've had a couple of people uh, say, "Is that really that different from what key account managers have have done in the past? Aren't MSLs already covering a lot of these these things and and, and obviously trying to go in that direction already?" So just give us a a flavour of of what you see as being the key differences, I guess, with what we've got now and what you're proposing. Well, it's it's interesting that you bring up the subject of the MSLs because, again, with our customers in the past two years, they have actually asked us to help them with their MSLs because they see the MSLs as that critical bridge between the commercial model and the sales team and the marketing team and the R&D side. So we have actually helped the MSLs uh, uh, retain key knowledge on the science side that they need to have uh, to be able to share with the customer. So the big shift we're seeing is that there is medical affairs and the MSLs are actually getting at more actively involved with the sales teams. Either they're going on calls with them or they're actually helping the sales teams better understand the science behind the products as well as the disease area. So that is a key shift that we've seen from our customer base in just the last two years. Okay, thank you. Before we go on to the next section, I'm just going to allow Chris, because I think he has a, a quick something to add uh, before we move on. Chris. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, it's an important point the, the, in discussing this topic is MSLs and reps. And, you know, in pharma, we see a big separation, sort of a, a Chinese wall, if you will, there. Uh, but we have to realize that the MSL often doesn't want to be a commercial colleague. They want to be a medical colleague. And pharma wants to use them as uh, to do what reps used to do, which is to talk quite expansively, kind of like Michael's talking about, but can't do that today. So one of the key things that we have to do that the rep of the future will have to do is understand exactly as Michael suggests, when to bring the MSL in and not to sort of try to be the MSL, but bring them in at the right point. As well, we'll have to train MSLs to embrace their communication side and that you're not a medical colleague, sort of cloistered away, but you're out here 
you're a customer facing colleague and you're part of the value prop to the customer. So those things all have to stitch together um, to make things go right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to pause that discussion there because what I'm going to do now is just uh, go to the audience uh, and, and find out exactly where everybody sits uh, currently. So if you look at your screen now, uh, you'll see a question pop up on it, uh, and uh, I'd like everybody to uh, have a go at answering it. So where are you currently at regarding moving your sales reps from a transactional model, um, and perhaps you could say traditional model, to a more value-added educational and personalized model? Um, obviously, I've not defined precisely where the start and the end points are there. So this is very much down to your uh, own uh, sense of where you are, uh, but really appreciate it if you could, you could uh, identify where you think you are. So your rep interaction model is already only value add, that's the top option. Uh, we've got solid plans and we're ahead of the competition, so that's you know, not quite as far as the, as the first one, but, but making good progress. The third one, it's sporadic, depending on the therapy or staff involved. So maybe it's driven by individuals or, or driven by uh, the needs of one particular uh, therapeutic area. Uh, it's poor, we want to get there, but we haven't made much progress as yet. Or finally, non-existent and likely to be non-existent going forward because it's not the direction that we're moving in. So I can see approximately 50% of people have voted so far. I'm going to hold that open for another three or four seconds. So four, three, two, one. One. Thank you very much to everybody who voted. Let's have a look at the results. Okay, so um, I'd say middling it would be my uh, immediate assessment of, of our progress here. There's a good 15-14% uh, of you uh, who say, say that they're ahead uh, and that they're actually uh, doing this, but uh, we have a bit of a normal distribution uh, with the majority in the middle. So keen to come to our uh, panelists now um, and uh, basically um, find out from from them whether or not they uh, would would uh, where they would uh, go on this uh, on this diagram on this uh, question uh, and also uh, indeed what you believe individually the key things in order to make progress going forward actually are. So Ulivik is your top left on the screen. Would you like to answer first? Sorry, Ludovic, you were muted there. Um, you can talk now. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot. So I think we, we we're sitting on the middle, so we've got we do have room for improvement there, which is good. I think that uh, within the question, uh, we've got uh, we really have different uh, dimension, and uh, I think the educational piece is particularly true and particularly important if you think our our current business model. Uh, and here I would maybe make a differentiation between MSLs and, uh, and Salesforce. And I think that uh, the, the MSLs are, are clearly recognized as the people who are carrying the science and really need to, uh, to, to, to bring in the, the, the information. And we need to ensure that we bring the Salesforce to the to this same level because the transactional role that they used to have, and I, I assume that a lot of them of the Salesforce have moved out from that, is clearly going to be taken care of by other means and more digital me means or other uh, or other um, companies, maybe. Um, Paul, maybe um, could you jump as well to, to my slide, please? Patrick speaking here. Um, because I think it's important when uh, looking at the question, I, I think um, we, we share the sentiment that um, there is still much to do, if you wish, in, in, in shifting the traditional pharma model. I think one of the key things, what you can see uh, probably on the slide as well, is when we speak to our uh, customers, they don't even want to be called customers, if you wish. So they want to be seen as partners. They want to be seen as uh, when we are engaging with them, that we truly understand as well their needs and that our value proposition that we put forward to them in the interaction is really meaningful to them. And that could be also providing the drug that is really uh, uh, specifically targets higher med medical needs. I think when you look into the traditional um, pharma cycle or the selling cycle that has been uh, over the years, I mean, our current model, I think it's clear that you know we, we discover innovation, we develop, we define indications, and we try to sell it to the market. I think what, what I try to do in, in, for us in, in Daichi Sankyo, and as well, I think overarchingly, 
um, is to really connect all the dots um, with our customers, put them in the middle, and then have um, not only uh, sales reps or MSL, the entire organization focusing around those needs. And I think that um, the involvement of many different functions across the organization is absolutely key and a, a, a big role plays as well the interaction with R&D. Um, and I think so the, the model of the future and the sales rep of the future will have to be not only an educator and a, and a good listener, but he will have to be really the sparing partner of our, um, of our different stakeholders that we have. So payers, uh, regulators become even more important for all of us in the industry. So I think um, there is a clear need to prolong the selling cycle, identify the needs and make sure we are impactful by truly having our customer needs at the forefront, what we do in R&D, but also uh, in, in the developing models. That will require, and we, I think we will come to that later, a very different sort of um, engagement with our customer facing roles and our uh, MSLs and comms. Uh, and I think there is much more to be said about this, but I think we will touch on this a bit later. I, I completely agree with um, both Michael and Patrick when uh, Michael mentioned that we are moving to a more consultative role and when Patrick mentions um, that we should be a partner and not just a supporter, let's say so. Uh, Paul, may I ask you um, just to show my uh, first slide, please? Okay, thank you. So we all agree that the environment is, um, the environment where we're acting is completely changing day by, by day. And nowadays each sales rep is addressing a broader network of stakeholders and there is a major shift towards an outcomes and value-based focus. We all agree on, uh, on that. And it's clearly the time now, today, to start investing on identifying the right talent, to start working on talent retention, and also on, um, on development. And one of the exercises I made in preparation for the, for the call today was not only thinking and focusing on the, on the environment where we are acting, but think uh, about what will we uh, sell in 2000. 50. This is just a, a theoretical uh, exercise, but I found it quite um, quite exciting, let's say, because I, I personally think that from more personalized medicines to commodities in 2050, companies will not be selling just a simple medicine. We are not just offering a, a therapy. I think that companies will be co-packaging diagnostic options, personalized medicines, and support programs. And here is where the, the role that Michael was mentioning about more consultative um, sales rep is, um, is for me uh, applying. The commercial model will change dramatically and something really critical uh, is to ensure that for the salespeople, for all other functions in the, in the company, the patient is in the center of everything uh, we do. This is a, a very, uh, I really like this slide and it's a very forward thinking way of doing, of, of thinking. And uh, I actually think that we need to uh, uh, think about the skills that are required for those type of roles. And uh, if you really think about it, we don't have a crystal ball today. So those skills may be uh, uh, completely different than what we know today. And therefore, we may only teach to our field forces to really to learn how to learn. This is for me the, the, the key thing is really to insist on, the, on those more soft skills and to teach them to learn how to learn because we don't know yet what those roles will be. Yeah, I, I think it, come all, it comes all down to um, being very um, also open-minded and entrepreneurial in the approach that our um, customer facing roles will have to take i mean there will be a change will be a constant um, because like you like uh, the others mentioned as well commercial model will evolve so we need also very entrepreneurial thinking forward thinking people who can adapt in a changing environment and the environment is changing rapidly through um, also market access trends that are coming in so i think um, having only true um, true value add medicines that will be reimbursed will also really drive the access component of and the understanding of access into the commercial field force. So it's rather than just not only selling a drug, I think they will have to understand the entire network that surrounds it, including access. 
So I think when we are when we are recruiting now in our build out, of course, what we are look, looking for is not only the entrepreneurship and a, a really um, scientifically educated person. Um, we look also for capabilities that are, um, you know, really able to make quick and fast decisions. We will also put we also put down P and L responsibility uh, even on a on a key account manager level. Uh, so they can really take fast decision directly at the customer, but they have to understand the value chain and they have to understand access and uh, also have to understand what, if they take decisions, what it will take. So I think it's really um, down to a very personalized approach and culture plays a big role into that as well. And we have been talking up front as well a lot about culture, but I think that's something we can talk about as well a bit later. Yeah, Patrick, this is Chris. I think that you make a really good point, as does this slide, because what this slide outlines as we go from, you know, a, a therapy to a whole package of things is it's going to allow an evolution in, in how we manage and organize our customer-facing colleagues. In the, in the old, if you will, it was very activity-driven. Um, yeah, I have a good friend who's uh, a VP of sales and farm, and he says, I know how to get 500 people to do three or four things. And that's a very old-school way of thinking about what we need and you know, we need the people to show up say certain things do certain things it's an activity driven model and i think for us to evolve as we go to this co-package in 2050 what that allows is a focus on results instead of activity and when we can focus on results we can we can hire different people people who can be more strategic people who can be more accountable um, the old model tended to focus on somebody who could identify that they've made the best efforts to sort of show up and do what they were supposed to do. The new model can enable more of a, an account management focus on a whole package of value. And in the end, the package was either purchased or delivered to the customer, and the customer's value in it, or they're not. And we can assess someone's effectiveness that way. So that takes a little bit different type of person to be comfortable in that second environment uh, because it's uh, the blinding glare of accountability can be um, not what everybody wants. So that's important where we're going with that package of things. It allows us to look at and assess people in front of the customer differently. And that's going to be a big part of where we go when we go to the reps of the future. Thank you, Chris. And I think we could probably talk for quite some time about exactly what measurements uh, and, and, and the uh, actual situations we, we would actually want everybody to achieve actually are. Um, I'm going to... Um, take a slightly different tack, which um, we, we will come back to this, of course. I'm going to ask you guys, if you look at the, in front of you right now, you're going to see a question which you might not be expecting at this stage. Um, Ten years from now, which scenario in the customer sales department do you believe to be the most likely? And I've thrown up five, I admit they're all my ideas, um, five somewhat uh, unexpected or, or, well, some of them might be very expected uh, situations that uh, we, we, we may well see within 10 years. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this at this stage is just because I feel like if we're coming onto a discussion of how we're actually driving this behavior shift that we need to create within our, uh, uh, customer facing roles, what sort of situations are we likely to find ourselves in? Um, so I'll hold this open for a few more seconds. I can see only about 15% of people have voted so far. So get your votes in. Uh, all customers effectively replaced by computers as uh, data drives the payers and uh, effectively payers uh, are, are, are just um, really just following an equation as opposed to a human uh, situation. Uh, pharma companies jointly promoting health concierge services. So what I mean by that is uh, uh, beyond the beyond the pill model. Um, really here, companies are seeing a uh, financial value in promoting non-medicine products, uh, and that's a likely scenario. Uh, third one is human touch endures, but reps are largely replaced by um, the MSL uh, and certainly by a more educational role. Um, so we're keeping our reps, but we are taking away from uh, traditional sales reps uh, and, and really focusing on the MSL far more. Um, fourthly, the TripAdvisor for drugs drives um, much of our professional decision making. Um, we've actually seen Thermo, the, uh, the, the US-based uh, physician network, actually uh, making a lot of progress here recently. Um, and uh, indeed, it's certainly uh, likely to happen. But is that going to be uh, the, the major way in which uh, decisions are made? Um, and then finally, patients drive drug decisions through wearable data uh, and obviously all other kinds of um, 
personally reported outcomes data feeding directly into electronic health records potentially uh, and um, obviously um, with the Amazon uh, rumors which have since been quashed they're not pursuing it just now um, but uh, there was a threat for a while that that's how a lot of uh, drive so effectively patients driving the decisions would be that final option so right I've been talking for long enough now let's see what we actually think as results close the vote got most of you in there let's have a look okay so we do actually have a fair bit of variety here but there's a couple of losers and a couple of winners that's for sure so um, we don't see that the uh, human touch will be lost we don't see that the customers will be replaced by uh, computers um, a quarter of us do think that the health concierge services is, is the most likely of these situations that was actually higher than I was expecting so that's very interesting um, perhaps the most practical um, but uh, interesting we do see that the MSL will win <laughs> certainly when it comes to, to, to numbers and, and effort and, and uh, investment um, and uh, the trip advisor not seen as the most uh, influential um, and then finally another quarter almost uh, patient driven uh, drug spend uh, I imagine obviously that being higher in the uh, US with DTC uh, than elsewhere uh, but increasingly so so um, Ludovic I think you might have something to say immediately so over to you yeah first of all I'm very uh, frustrated because I couldn't vote as a speaker but that's fine now the, the, the thing that, that I wanted to, co to comment on is really around the, the third point where we talk about human touch and jurors but reps replaced by MSL educators I've got a feeling that this is the current model. Uh, that's where we are, and we, we've been talking about future of, of pharma, but I think that there's the, the, issue, the future in the next two to three years, and then the future in 10 years. And if you think about the future in two to three years, this is where we are around a lot of, if you think about the more specialized area we, uh, we are in in pharma, if you think about oncology, this is what's clearly up, happening. The MSLs are, 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 are ramping up, and if there's no, uh, big need of, of scientific education, then uh, it's replaced by digital. Digital. Mm -hmm. So today, I really feel that we are already in this uh, in this um, situation, and, and the, the role of the sales sales rep here is really going to be a gatekeeper and a and a, a quarterback that is going to uh, that is going to distribute the the different services that the the, the HCP needs. Mm. Um, maybe let me just jump in here uh, uh, quickly because I think I, I would also underline what you just said, but I would probably put a, a bit of a different notion to it in terms of um, the importance. I think also I fully agree that the human touch will absolutely be part of the future as well in one way or the form. I think this interaction will be limited to really, if you wish, top class science and actually enabling our partners, our customers to the peer to peer network exchange. So I think the classical selling uh, will almost become, if you wish, uh, obsolete. I think it will happen naturally because the product that will be reimbursed in the future will have to show true value. So what we will do is really being partnering up, providing services, providing a really touching on their needs. And what we have done, for example, also in our model was already go, gone away from the classical, if you wish, ratio between sales and, and MSLs, uh, you know, as you know, is one to three, one to four, one to five, one sale, three sales reps, four sizes, one MSL. We have gone to a one to one ratio. Um, so that's not easy to do in, in the beginning. So um, for us, it was really important that we are putting that on. And let me make a slightly controversial st statement here, which is uh, science sells. Yeah. So when you take that really down to the bottom of it, um, you will not need to sell as such uh, in a transactional way, but that will, as I mentioned before, become a natural procedure if you enable our customers to really do what they have to do. And I think in the future, we will see that the ratio is totally uh, shifting towards probably one to three, one to four, one to five. Um, one key account manager, I would not even call them anymore sales reps, uh, will face probably six MSLs. And they will be part of the value cycle, not the selling cycle, but the value ci cycle creating, enabling top class science discussions and peer to peer exchange. So a totally different model that we will see. Uh, and um, I also think that drugs that are not adding this value and uh, will not be likely to be reimbursed in 10 years from now. So selling those really high medical needs and drugs that do that will 
from my perspective, will almost become obsolete, and we need to really uh, think very differently. Science sells. I think I think I'll chip in on that and say yes, science absolutely sells. And you know, a, a very very brief history lesson that a lot of what MSLs do today, at least in the United States, sales reps used to do back in the 90s. Now regulatory um, uh, requirements have mandated that they no longer can speak about many of those things. But I think a lot of the focus on an MSL is, uh, if you look at what a typical pharma rep did, in the, at least in the U.S. in the 90s, um, it's essentially what MSLs do today, but the MSLs are regulatory, you know, and they're in a safe harbor. In the United States, some court cases, things like that have pushed things around. So I think the human touch part of this question will endure. I think I saw something recently, 45% of customers prefer that as their primary means of getting information and, and learning about the therapies. So the human touch endures. I don't know that it's always going to be a credentialed MSL as the regulatory environment, you know, tends to swing back and forth. Uh, I do think in the United States, at least, um, there'll be someone filling that role of, of science cells, but it may be this rep of the future. And that may be a little controversial and not necessarily a credentialed PharmD type MSL, but essentially doing the same thing. It's just who does it will be a, perhaps the person who's historically done it if you look further back. Yeah. Uh, let me let me just just add. I completely agree with um, with with your comments, and I think that MSLs uh, are clearly extremely good educators. And in the future, the scientific level of expertise will be much more critical. I don't know who will driven uh, these discussions, but from my point of view, I think that um, a sales representative must navigate on discussions around diagnostic, be able to train others to discuss outcomes, and they really. Need totally to be agree. Quite um, well, um, well prepared. And obviously, that we can discuss if the role should be um, more on the um, on the MSL shoes, on the medical advisor, on the sales or key or key account. But I think that apart from um, this level of expertise and apart um, from um, driven value um, as um, as trusted partners, I think that there are some some other abilities that the future sales rep. Uh, will need to have, and that I, do, I don't see those kinds of abilities being seated on the on the MSL desk. I think that both MSLs and, and, and key accounts and sales reps must address healthcare professionals and other stakeholders' needs. I think that's something that we should agree is that e-detailing will be that very soon, and each sales rep needs to actively listen and understand customer needs, and then adapt their own um, their messages to what the, the healthcare professional, the physician, the administra administrative um, people in the in the hospital want um, to be supported on. And we will be also um, need to be able to sell to new customers. Uh, and the activities of the sales team no longer will focus on visiting doctors and on medical information. The focus is on addressing the needs of a broader mm -hmm. network of buyers and influencers, and all the stakeholders uh, will expect to be part of the of the conversation. So, completely agree that the level of expertise from a scientific point of view needs to be very high. But then there are some other capabilities that we should um, work on. Yeah, the the building of capabilities is very important. I agree with you, and this is something that needs to be worked on with the MSLs. And I'm hoping that most of pharma or building those capabilities for field medical around the, the, the skills that you traditionally uh, think Salesforce has. I'm thinking about the soft skills, the, 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 the development of the, 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 uh, the knowledge of themselves, the knowledge of their customers. These are capabilities that we build with, uh, with, the, MSL, with the MSLs, and I think that pharma companies are in different states uh, on that, but clearly it's, a, it's an area of investment. Uh, this is uh, Michael Connolly from QStream again. <clears throat> I would just like to share with you uh, the feedback that we get from our customers. Uh, we do regularly survey our customers around this topic, and for the most part, they do come in on that middle ground there of the 43%. The one constant is that unique relationship between the sales rep and, let's say, the doctor. That is not going to go away. That's sacrosanct. But it's the way that it is now, it's, it is changing how it goes about. So it is not necessarily guaranteed that as a sales rep, you will continue to have that relationship. You are going to change. And I'll just share with you, uh, one of our customers did tell us that two years ago, 
they found that a lot of their sales reps were just not getting in to, uh, in to see doctors. The number of visits was, had fallen. And when they surveyed the doctors, they found out that the doctor said to them, look, uh, we're not learning anything anymore from these guys. They're not bringing us any value. So they used right. Qstream in the space of two years. They actually found that um, the, the number of calls did then go back up because the, the, the conversation had changed completely from transactional to value. So that's just one instance of where uh, you will always have that relationship between the rep and the doctor, but you've just got to make sure that it is the, the rep is doing it in the right way. Yeah, Thank Michael, you, Michael, of course, um, I, I, go on. I, I just Quickly, chime go. in on that, that we've seen that even in neurology, um, you know, where we saw the ability to reach doctors, you know, go down and it started to come back as more products began to be launched in the neurology space. It's an area that I've worked in it, to exactly your point, though, that the, the rep had something to say that wasn't the same thing they'd said for years. And there's value in that. So that, that's a spot on comment, Michael. I'm not surprised that customers told you that. Um, thank you. Uh, I just want to bring the audience in. Um, I'm getting a, a lot of questions and um, I'm aware we haven't had uh, time to address them just yet. So I'm going to read a few out and then uh, allow the panelists to, to have a go at uh, answering them. Um, there's a lot of people um, who are talking about uh, the fact that we even call them reps and uh, surely we need to move away from that. We need to be uh, calling our teams customer facing and determine the, the skills the customers are looking for and work backwards from, from the customer in that regard and stop attempting to categorize them. I realize to a degree regulations and, and the purity of our medical departments are affected when we try to uh, mix with, mess with that too much, but uh, there's cl clearly a desire there from a customer point of view. Um, there's a lot of people People who are saying, you know, everything we're talking about is all very well, but you know, we're still talking incrementally in so many ways. We're not really addressing the question of disruption. What's going to really disrupt the current sales rep and uh, MSL model, Airbnb, Uber, Amazon, Google models, um, etc. So, uh, and uh, I'm just trying to find it again. Oh yes, uh, Stuart Adkins, hello Stuart, saying uh, pharma simply doesn't have the core competencies to do all of the things mentioned on the 2050 slide or even the 2010 slide. Amazon, Google might, uh, and only the obviously the, the drug access needed to, to fill uh, the gap. Um, a lot of people also talking about um, uh, pricing and reputation and, and trust uh, situations there, which is not something that we've, we've focused on a huge amount. Um, and uh, a lot of people also talking about entrepreneurship. Um, Stefan, for example, uh, saying, uh, how do we actually instill more entrepreneurial skills, uh, create a, a play more towards decisiveness on the spot and maneuverability instead of just soldiering on? So lots of questions. And, and finally, one question, I guess, from me, um, which is that, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about these, these reps and MSLs becoming uh, quarterbacks, I think was the phrase that we used. And, and as they sort of become superhuman, I've got a few people sort of saying, are we trying to create a one size fits all approach? Are we trying to create all of this within one person? And my question, I guess, is are we willing to invest in that person to the degree, you know, our sales reps and MSLs are the least well rewarded people within our organizations in many cases. Uh, are we, you know, if we're expecting these people to be able to do so much, are we willing to actually make that investment in a smaller number of people perhaps, but more able? So there's quite a lot I've just thrown at our panel just there, obviously too much for any single one of you to answer. I'm very keen to see who wishes to take me up on one of those and, and, and go for it. Paul, it's, I, I'll take you up on disruption. Um, I think that's an important point and a, and, a, and a well taken point. And I don't think that the disruption will come just in like uh, like we've seen in other in the tech sector and so forth. The disruption is not going to come from the huge big players on the scene today. Uh, the big pharma companies we're all familiar with and that many of us are, have been part of. The disruption is going to probably come from somebody who's starting from scratch and moving forward from there. I think the disruption is also going to come as you see devices become part of the package. Um, and the people who come from the device world or, or the, the tech world, the software world, are going to demand uh, a new, different type of model. But it's going to come from a company that we may not have heard of today. It's going to come from a company that's starting from scratch and is choosing to do things differently. So that's my, my two cents on the topic of where's the disruption going to happen and who's going to do it. And to be fair, the question we are asking is really the business model we want to go to. Today, uh, in pharma, we are selling drugs. 
uh, and, and we know that at one stage this is we're going to continue selling drugs, but 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 in a, in a different way. And we need to think about ourselves. As IBM was 15 years ago, they were selling computers, and they realized that it, it wasn't working anymore. So they had to sell the services, and the product was embedded into the, the services. And I think this is really where it needs to be more ambitious than only thinking about the new uh, uh, rep or the new MSL or whatever we call it, because I, I also truly believe that it's shared forces and not a, a clear separation. But we really need to think about, okay, what type of business model we want to have. And based on this business model, then our roles will, will evolve. And, and I quite like the, the idea of the, the Amazon piece, maybe not through a, an Amazon, but saying, okay, all the, this information is available. Uh, we've got a lot of information that is available uh, digitally, and maybe uh, our, our customers are, going, are just going to connect to a portal to, uh, to, to be able to choose which drug is the most uh, adequate to, um, for a customer. We, we don't know. And the only way we can act on that is to really develop some skills with our with our field teams that are the skills of adaptability, the skills of learning how to learn. And, and let me let me build upon this because I think this could add a tremendous value if you really understand also, you know, the current capabilities that, that there is in the market and with the sales forces and the customer facing roles we have. And I think we need to then understand as well how we can upscale and I think it's really down to the individual level. I think uh, we've been talking about individualized onboarding, personalized training for a long time. I think it's really time that we take that serious and also really look on the individual. And that has a cultural aspect, but uh, really make sure that the individual feels um, having a purpose, having a clear understanding of what needs to happen and then feels empowered and feels as well supported by the organization, by the entire organization, um, which I would say is like a key account organization that uh, focuses on the needs of, of the customers and employees, and then really he can add value. And I think that um, this aspect of, of cultural shift and uh, with this changing environment will play a big role in the future. The culture will become uh, absolutely um, key for, for being as innovative and entrepreneurial. And I also agree that disruption, disruption will come uh, in different ways uh, along the way, and we might not have heard from these companies. I, I fully support that as well. Uh, this okay. is uh, Michael Connolly again from QStream. Just again, I'll share with you again uh, our customer experiences and how they are transitioning and uh, kind of crossing the chasm, if you will, to this new model. <clears throat> Two things you have to consider that are very important. Uh, number one, the role of the frontline manager. We haven't talked about the frontline managers at all today, but they are a critical component in this. And what our customers tell us is that um, the frontline managers who coach, they draw a correlation between the coaching of the frontline managers and the success, success of their teams. And they see a definite correlation there. So you need to have hands-on, proactive frontline managers. We all know they're very, very busy people, but they've got to be able to coach their reps. So therefore, it's incumbent upon them that they're able to demon demonstrate superior science knowledge as well. They have to be able to shift with this model. So the frontline manager is a critical part of this component. The other thing you need to think about as well is your compensation model. You're going to have to change it. It's going to have to move away from the incentive-based model that was you know, predicated upon how many, how many prescriptions did the doctor write to something that's maybe based on value. Maybe that's feedback you get from the doctors themselves about the interaction they had with the customer. So those are two things that as you transition to this model, you'll need to factor those into the equation. Thank you, Michael. I'd agree with you, particularly on the, uh, the 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 second point that you've made. I've just written an article myself on 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 that, it, uh, and uh, the fact we need to focus on learning uh, and value as, as as a core thing, rather than on short termism. And uh, no more is that more acute, obviously, within our uh, our reps uh, and uh, and and sales focused uh, organisation. Um, I'm getting a lot of audience questions in. I'm aware we've only got ten minutes left. Uh, getting a lot of audience questions in, partly aligned with what everyone's talking about right now, which is the um, the culture aspect, and also a lot of people talking about internal management, and indeed how we actually 
um, go around uh, internally in making sure that uh, we've got the right uh, skills. I'm going to ask, therefore, the audience a question. If you have a look at your screens right now, you'll see it popping up. The quality of cross-functional interaction between different customer-facing reps, we're talking reps, we're talking uh, CAMs, we're talking MSLs, we're talking market access individuals, we're even talking patient advocacy, is number one, advanced, number two, good with techniques and calls well shared, two, with uh, good coordination between groups for individual customers, fair, some interaction, but, but systems simply not in place, or finally poor, very little or no planned interaction. And I suppose I'm asking this question at this stage because uh, in our conversation prior to uh, this uh, webinar, we, uh, we felt as panelists that this was uh, critical in actually um, being able to advance the skills of the, um, of the rep was indeed how we, uh, how we actually uh, manage ourselves internally and bring these different customer-facing roles into contact with one another. So really keen to see where the current situation is with our audience. I'm going to hold that open for another three seconds. I've got about 45% of you voted. Let's get those votes in. Come on, come on. Three, two, one. Thank you so much to everybody there. Let's have a look at the results. So um, we're, again, got a bit of a normal distribution going on here, with perhaps a, a little push down towards the lower fare, some interaction with systems not in place. So you've all talked about these multi-skilled customer-facing roles. We've all agreed there was no real uh, difficulty with that as, as, as an agreement uh, that that's the way we're going. But right now, we aren't even managing to, to, to have the cross-functional conversations happening internally. So do we really have a chance, guys? Do we really Are we really going to make a, uh, a success of this when it, clearly we're still very siloed? Maybe, maybe Paul or Patrick here. I, I think there is one part of um, information sharing. There is one part there that is also what is the difference between insight and information. And I think what we have tried to do in our day-to-day -day work uh, here at Daiji Sankyo was to enable constant and immediate uh, insight sharing, not an information overload, but really truly insight sharing. And we have created systems because I think there is a fair comment that also you need to make sure um, that the infrastructure enables you as well, and it's not only dependent on the infrastructure, it's a lot about attitude, but also the infrastructure should, should support. So we have built a CRM system across Europe in one language where all of our key account managers speak the same language. They can share uh, information, they can share their account plans, they can share the insights, and uh, that can happen real time. Uh, and we will take this forward, so we just started building this, but it's really absolutely adamant that those insights uh, have a real time, I would say, uh, address point that they reach and that we are then filtering and that we are putting back into the system of understanding and learning um, what those insights are so that all the functions can really profit from it and build a database. So that will also trigger different understanding of marketing. So this traditional marketing approach is not really required for that. So we are defining cluster types of customers and of value needs, and then we develop solutions for it, which is very different to say, I do a, a sales brochure for Germany. We don't do that. What we do is to identify customer needs, build tailor-made solutions, and, um, and create this win-win. But we can only do that if this information flow goes into the system, out of the system, at constant level, constantly evolving, creating sales aids or or customer type solution instantly every week new. So this is what we are planning to do basically also, but that is a, a huge task that we are undertaking. So we are testing it and we will start with it, but I think it's, it's something pointing towards a very different sort of marketing, sharing, inside information databases, plus cultural and attitude. That is key. Yeah, Patrick, it's Chris real quick. I think to get the better results on this question, and, and you touched on it there very briefly, two things that we've talked about already. One is culture. If the culture inside an organization values the interaction and the coordination, it will be, and it's rewarded, that's the second piece. We talked about incentives. Uh, everyone in the organization has to be incentivized to deliver these behaviors, the very thing you just talked about there, Patrick. So. Yeah. So, so we have also adapted our uh, also our incentives will exactly reflect that. Uh, agree to this. This has to go all hand in hand. And culture, you don't you don't change easily, but it is a must. 
it is a very open-minded uh, approach that every function has to take within the boundaries of, of compliance, of course. But um, we, we should test those boundaries because if we move away from a sales-based incentive, also our sales um, people, whatever we call them, they, they, they might be incentivized on different things so they can also talk about different things um, rather than yep. only uh, making, making the sales. So they, they will be empowered and enabled to have a very different conversation with the customer uh, in a compliant way. Uh, this is uh, Michael Connolly from QStream again. Uh, what I want to share with you is the role of the sales enablement professional. We are seeing in our customer base that the, um, the sales enablement professional, their role is getting stronger and stronger. I was out yesterday and I met a lady who has moved from one of the big pharma companies to a mid-sized European pharma company uh, because she was, very, she was very successful in the sales enablement side at her previous employer. The company she, she has joined is very siloed, and the CEO of that company recognizes that, and that's why she hired this particular individual. And we talked yesterday about her challenges, breaking down these silos. But I think, again, if it comes from the top down, and if there is a sense that this is the way of the future, you will break down those barriers. And I see that uh, the sales enablement professionals, and I'm sure there are a lot of you on this call today, your role is actually going to be very critical in making that happen. Thank you. Um, by the way, I'm getting a lot of uh, effectively nodding heads uh, from the audience in terms of, uh, of, of what you guys are saying. A lot of people saying uh, things like, you know, uh, I totally agree we have to move these KPIs away from activity-based counterproductive measures and far more towards value and learning measures. I've got a couple of people who are disagreeing as well, uh, I have to say, um, but uh, the majority saying uh, agreeing with, with what you guys uh, are saying. Uh, and indeed, uh, Michael echoing some of the comments you've just made as well. Uh, I'm aware that we've only got a minute left and I've got probably in the, of the order of 30 or 40 unanswered questions from the audience. So I wonder whether or not we can um, uh, ask our panelists to have a go at sort of asking, answering some of them in a written form post, uh, in written form post, post event. Uh, and maybe that's a way in which we can get sure. answers to you. Um, does anyone um, wish to close out our session today with only a minute left with uh, a practical recommendation. We've talked a lot about what we have to do 10 years time. It's very clear that the situation is going to be different from today. But if you had to emphasize one thing above all, and I'm not going to ask you to take, say, culture, because we've obviously talked about that um, very briefly now. Um, but uh, is there anything else from a practical sense that uh, the average person listening to this call, uh, sort of director level, VP level person, should uh, implement and should prioritize going forward from here? Any, anyone want to answer that? Paul, this is Chris. I'll chime in and say capabilities. Everybody should go into their organization and look at the hiring profiles that you give to recruiters that bring people into these roles in your company and ask yourself if those are written for today or for the future. Very just succinct. To, and uh, Danny, well, can argue with that one. Chris, anyone else? Well, just to, just look to it. And as yep. we have um, a few uh, a few senior managers and some top manager top managements on the on the call. I think that management plays an important role, a critical role of building a patient centricity culture, and this will be key to define the sales reps and MSLs roles in the in the future. But something also very important for these functions is to enable the collaboration and the coordination among and between sales and non-sales functions uh, here, and this will also. Um, support the definition of these roles in the in the future. So management has a really important role here on this change uh, process. Yeah, Ludovic speaking, I would say like look at your look at your business model, invest in data and in digital, and invest in your people development and their soft skills. Thank you. Data was actually uh, one of the chapters that we didn't quite get to, um, uh, and I apologize for that, but it's, uh, I think we all agree it has to, has to be both a part of the sourcing and of the delivery of a customer-facing uh, person going forward. Uh, and any final comment, Michael? No, I think uh, the other panelists pretty well touched all the key points that uh, you need to do going forward. Excellent. All right. Well, somehow it feels like we've wrapped up quite neatly, therefore, uh, despite the fact that we do have a fair few uh, audience questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to cover them all, but it's great that uh, this was an energetic uh, session and certainly got you all fired up. Uh, and uh, we'll obviously see what we can do in terms of answering those in the future. 
really appreciate uh, your time to each of the panelists that are with us. Um, I'm sure you've noticed in the bo bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a couple of notices there about uh, upcoming events. Um, they're not till 2019, but believe it or not, they're already gathering quite a lot of momentum, and they're also going to be a, a fair bit different from, from what you've seen from those events before. We're really uh, scaling up on that front, so some exciting stuff to announce. Uh, and finally, just want to say thank you again to QStream, who've been really supportive uh, and a real help uh, in driving today's uh, session and conversation, uh, and really appreciate, Michael, you and your team uh, for that. So thank you so much. Um, I will let you guys uh, go and enjoy the rest of your days, but uh, really appreciate it. So I'm going um, to hold this webinar open for a couple more minutes in the hope that uh, those of you still listening might give me a little bit of feedback and let me know whether or not you, you liked today's session, whether or not there was a, a burning issue that you feel that we should cover going forward, uh, whether or not you've got anything specific more that you want to ask, uh, or even just a lovely message to, uh, for us all to go home with. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it open for a couple more minutes, but uh, for the time being, thank you so much for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm sure we will talk very soon. Thank you.